thank you for being here. I want to welcome those who are watching by live stream as well. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we've had a bit of a problem with our online stuff this morning, so hopefully uh, you're watching me right now or you're watching me later uh, on playback during record, okay? So thanks for doing that. By the way, my name is Joe. I'm the lead pastor here. If I've not met you, I'd love to meet you this morning before you leave. I'm going to be in the comments right out here after the service. Please come by and say hello. Introduce yourself. Uh, maybe this is your first Sunday back in a long time because of COVID. Please come by and let me put a name with your eyeballs. Okay, so just do that right out there. That would help me greatly. If you're around me very much, you already know this. I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know, but I just want you to know that I know that you know that I know that you know this. Things still throw me. You would think as old as I am at 60 and as many times as I've been around the block, things wouldn't throw me quite so much, but things still throw me. And the problem is <laughs> people know when I get thrown by stuff because I don't have what's called a poker face. I, uh, I have learned through the years to have sort of a filter from my mouth, but I have yet to find one for my face and especially these eyeballs. So when things throw me, they just go off. And even if I'm wearing a mask, <laughs> my eyes still go off and people see it. And I, it's one of those things that's kind of frustrating and embarrassing because you'd think I wouldn't be thrown by stuff so much anymore, but I still am. Am I the only one that has that happen? And I'm just going to talk to myself. Anybody else have that issue going on? Maybe, maybe you're sitting with someone. How, how about you know somebody that happens to? You'll be able to raise your hand. Yeah, there's some punching going on right now. Yeah, get your hand up, buddy. Yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah, we all have that going on, I think. And here's the thing. As we get more and more and more like Christ, that should happen less and less and less because Jesus was never thrown by anything. And yet I still get thrown by stuff. In fact, the scriptures teach us that when we get thrown by things, we actually are supposed to begin to enjoy that. What? Like crazy, right? Yeah. So this morning, we're going to look at a couple of verses in James chapter 1. So if you're willing, take your copy of God's Word and look in the book of James in the New Testament or open up the church app. All the verses we'll use will be right there. We started a series last week called The Wisdom Factor because the book of James is full of all kinds of very practical wisdom kinds of things. James was the half-brother of Jesus. He was writing to the church of his day, the big C church, all those who followed Jesus, and they, because of persecution, were scattered all over the place, and they were encountering all kinds of difficult things. Things were throwing them because they were following Jesus and standing up for Jesus, and they met great difficulty. And James actually said they would eventually begin to enjoy when they ran into difficult times. Sounds crazy, but let's look at it. James chapter 1, start with me in verse 2. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials. Now let's just stop there. Did you catch the operative word there? When you encounter various trials. Not if, <laughs> but when. I had a spiritual mentor in college who began to speak into my life and other people's lives, uh, my college buddies, and this is how Dr. Frankie Rainey has always said it. The follower of Jesus is always in one of three spots when it comes to trials and tests and temptations. Either they are headed into a season of testing and trial, or they're in the midst of a season of testing or trial, or they're coming out of a season of testing and trial. And if you're coming out of one, what does that mean? Well, eventually, ultimately, you're headed into the next one. Isn't that inspiring? Aren't you glad you came to church today? Aren't you glad you're watching online? Yeah, if you're like me, the answer is, because uh, 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 that just blows my mind. We're always being tested, having trials, temptations. I, I want us to see this particular word. Look at that word there, trial, testing. I don't know what your translation says. It may even say Temptation, that's a word it can be translated as. It's a word that has this particular quality to it. It is an instrument or experience that is used to test something to see whether or not that something that is being tested is valid or authentic. And so these things that we encounter, these difficult times, are tests and trials. 
And so when we run into them, those things that throw me, if it would be that I could just hear the bullhorn of life speaking into my ear, this is only a test, I might go, oh, well, cool, I'm glad it's only a test because I was pretty hyped up over it, and uh, I'm going to have to get better at this, because here's the truth. If we're always headed into one, or in the midst of, or coming out of one, and therefore heading into the next one, you and I better learn how to handle these difficult times, these tests these trials, if we could just understand they are a test. I, I'm not there yet. I don't catch them early enough. My eyes have already gone off by the time I hear the bullhorn. And so I, I don't know about you, but I need to get better at this stuff. And that's exactly what verse 3 and 4 talk about. Look in verse 3 and 4. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials. Verse 3, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Now, notice that it's our faith that is being given an opportunity to prove itself. It's our faith that's being tested as to its authenticity, whether or not it is valid or not. Our faith is giving, being given an opportunity to be validated, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Endurance and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, let's think about this for a minute. This testing, these trials, these temptations, one of the challenges that you and I have in dealing with them is we always want to know where they came from. We always want to know why. We always want to know the cause. And I want to share something with you. This text actually doesn't talk about the cause. He talks about the result that can happen of these tests and trials, but it doesn't actually talk about the cause. I mean, look, look in verse two, it says, when we encounter various trials, all kinds of different trials, all kinds of different sources. Sometimes it's because we live in an imperfect fallen world and life happens. Sometimes it is that, at least as far as tests and trials go, it might be that God at least allowed us to go through them. He may even bring some of those tests and trials our way. Now, temptation's different, and James explains that later on in the first chapter. You may want to look at that later on on your own, is that if it's a true temptation, that's not from God. That's, God doesn't tempt us, the scriptures say. But God at least allows us to go through trials and tests. So sometimes life does it. Sometimes God brings that our way unless it's a temptation. And quite frankly, if we're honest, isn't it true that sometimes the testing and trials and temptations that we face are a result of self-inflicted kinds of things that we've done or decided to do or put ourselves in that kind of situation. But this text doesn't really deal with the cause. What it deals with is the Result And the result is this, read it again, verses 3 and 4. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, let's unpack some of those words, because when I see the word perfect, I have bells and alarms and whistles that go off, because have I mentioned, <laughs> I still get thrown by things. I'm not there yet. So let's look at these words. The word there for endurance, it's the idea of perseverance, constancy, consistency, reliability. Our faith is being given an opportunity to prove its endurance, its consistency, its reliability. I don't know about you, but that, that's something we want in our faith, right? We want our faith to be uh, persevering and constant and consistent and reliable. So this is good stuff. So the result is something that is good for us. Let's keep reading. And that endurance has its perfect result so that you may be perfect. This word is actually a word that has to do with maturity. It does not mean absolute perfection without failure. Here's what it means. It is a word of integrity, meaning this, that, that when we grow and to become more and more like Christ and we can begin to take on these trials and these tests like Jesus would, then we will be able to see that our outward expression matches our faith that is on the inside. It's a word of integrity. 
so that we are integrated. We, we are the same on the outside as we are on the inside, same on the inside as we are on the outside. Our character and our actions match our verbiage and our words so that we don't just talk kind of church language on Sunday. We are able to live like followers of Christ Monday through Saturday. There's proof in the pudding. Our faith is validated. It's made perfect. It is made mature. It is made more and more like Christ. In other words... <laughs> This is the word that I see the filter for Joe's eyeballs not going off every time something throws him. Less and less do I react and more and more I'm able to respond. You know, that's the way of Jesus. Jesus was never thrown by anything. If you look at the the Gospels. And right now we're reading through the Gospel of Mark. And I want to encourage you to pick that up with us. There's a reading guide on our app. And every day there's a reading for uh, us in the Gospel of Mark right now. And as we read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what we realize is that Jesus is never really thrown by anything. He's not, his eyes never blow up and go off. Because he is able to see things through a heavenly perspective that we call wisdom. So the idea of Jesus dying on the cross didn't even throw Jesus. It is why he left heaven and came to the earth. In fact, when we read the Gospels, we see that Jesus said that no one took his life, but he laid it down for us because he has the authority to lay it down and take it back up. So not only did the cross not throw Jesus, the tomb did not throw Jesus. And he raised from the grave to live for all of eternity and grant us new life in himself. So in that resurrected life that we have, we can learn and be matured and be grown and be perfected, to have per perseverance, and take on these tests and these trials like Jesus did. One more word I want to unpack a little bit. The last phrase, complete, lacking in nothing. That means no holes, no gaps, no shortcomings. What kind of a life would we live so that no matter what kind of difficulty or testing or trial came our way, instead of it throwing us we are able to respond. Instead of reacting, we are able to respond like Jesus would respond. And the text says, look at verse 2, with joy. Now, Valerie and I, every Friday morning, we, we do something that you probably think is a little silly, but it's fun. It's, we, uh, we have breakfast together, and over that breakfast, every Friday morning, we take the New York Times weekly quiz. It's, it, I know that sounds, you wait, you're out of school and you're taking a test? Yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. I know, I know that sounds goofy as heck, but it, that's what we do. And it's just kind of fun. And what it is, it's 11 questions that the New York Times puts together to let us gauge and measure and validate and authenticate how well we've paid attention to the news of the previous week. And it's 11 questions. And sometimes they really get obscure and bizarre in fact, a lot of times when we're reading the news during the week, we often think, oh, I bet that's going to be on the weekly quiz on Friday. And so we, we, we approach it that way. And sometimes, I mean, we just get skunked. We, we can't even get one of the 11 answers right. And we kind of blame each other for that, for not paying attention, you know, uh, as if, you know, it was their fault that we didn't read the news either, okay? But oftentimes, even if we get nine or 10 correct compared to the other 50,000 people that do this every Friday, so we're not that weird, okay? We end up flunking because it takes like 11 out of 11 to get above 70 percentile. I mean, it's just amazing how that works. But, but we have fun doing that, and we laugh, and we, we joke, and, and it's just a fun way to... What if you and I begin to take on life's tests and trials like Valerie and I take on that Friday morning New York weekly news quiz? Because here's the deal. It doesn't really matter if we pass the little weekly quiz or not. And can I tell you something? Will you look this way? Lean in. You need to hear this. If you're a follower of Jesus, it matters that you grow to learn to take on tests and trials. And for me to take on tests and trials like God wants us to in victory with joy 
But here's the end. Even when we don't, even when we blow it, even when our eyes still go off and everybody knows it, in the end, we win. In the end, as followers of Christ, we are going to be living forever with him. We'll be victorious. And so we need to remember that when those tests and trials come, this has only been a test. We need to remember that and understand that it's just an opportunity to grow. Now, this idea of doing it with joy still <laughs> is challenging. Can I be honest with you about something where you look at I'm not there. I'm not there. I'm not, I'm not there. You'll see it. You, you'll see it this morning when we found out that the internet thing wasn't working here. And all our, I, knew, I wasn't handling it well because I knew what that meant. I knew my email box was going to fill up with people who were not happy because they weren't getting to watch us live. And so I, I, you know, I was trying to handle it well. If we could just learn to handle that with joy, consider it all joy, my brother. And I know you would like for me to unpack that word joy and try to explain that it doesn't mean quite what it means. It actually means exactly what it says. In fact, it's the same verbiage that Matthew used in describing the experience of the Magi when they were on their way to find the Christ child in Matthew chapter 2, verse 10. They were following this star that was leading them to find the Christ child. And it says, And when they saw the star in the east, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. These guys were high-fiving, fist-bumping. They were jumping up and down because the star was showing them. They were having that kind of joy. That's the same kind of joy James is talking about. Considered all joy like the Magi, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter very... <coughs> I'm not there yet. Are you? I'm not. So what's the difference? Well, I think the difference is wisdom. This whole series, we're talking about wisdom in the book of James. And wisdom is that spiritual insight, that godly perspective that he can give us to where we go. Oh, it was just, this is just a test. This, this, is, <laughs> this is just a test. I've got one friend that recently talked about how this one particular area of his life has been an area of temptation for a long time, and he has finally grown and developed and matured to the point where now every time the enemy brings that temptation into his life, he and God just laugh at the enemy. That's facing a trial with joy is what that is. So let's look at verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, now he's talking about wisdom here because for us to consider it all joy when we face various trials. It's going to take something we don't have within ourselves. It's going to take some godly, heavenly perspective. It's going to take some spiritual insight. James calls it wisdom. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Wisdom, this godly perspective, spiritual insight is ours for the asking. Last week, Evan, our teaching pastor, talked about this in here as he started the series in the book of James. And I just have to tell you, it was such a great message. I would encourage you that if you weren't here last Sunday or you haven't gone back and watched that, I, I want to encourage you to go back and take 25 minutes sometime this week and watch that message. It will help you understand this concept of wisdom. And you may be thinking, okay, what does this wisdom kind of look like? This spiritual godly insight that somehow brings joy even in the midst of difficulty, tests, trials. I will tell you, I think I've noticed a couple of examples of wisdom maybe at some of the most difficult times of my life. It's, it's not the only time I've sensed God given me wisdom about something and those times that he gives it to me and to you, it's clear that it's from him, right? Because there's no way you and I could come up with thinking that way. There's just no way. You know, people would say, man, you, you, are, you are full of wisdom. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm full of it, but it's God that's given me the wisdom, okay? I mean, you know, I, seriously, I don't think that any of this stuff could ever come on our own. We have to get it from God. He's the only source of this kind of looking at it. But there's been a couple times in my life where I think I've seen a hint of it, a glimpse of it, I want to share with you this morning. 
I don't know what it would look like for you, and I don't even know that if you would agree that these are examples of wisdom from God, but I, I think they might be. And some of you know about my experience uh, with, with what I would call a very light bout of cancer, if there is such a thing. I was 37 years old. Um, our kids at the time, they're 30, 26, and 23 now, but at the time they were six years old, three years old, and a month old. I'd been sick all year long, had recurring pneumonia in and out of the hospital five times, 37, Val was 33. On my 37th birthday, in the evening time, the doctor sat on the end of my bed and told me that I had cancer. He told me that I had lung cancer. I, the cause of this pneumonia that I had in my life was, was this little bitty small tumor about the size of the end of my thumb that was in my right lung in such a way that they were going to have to take out at least part, if not all, of my right lung and do this test. They had biopsied it and they knew it was malignant. So that was Thursday. On Monday, I had the surgery. They took out most of my right lung. You think I'm long-winded now. I could really go when I had two lungs. But anyway, I, they, they took out my right lung and then I was out of the pulpit for 16 weeks and I really believe God healed me. I mean, that was 23 years ago. So I'm so grateful for God's healing. But, but I want to share something with you. On that Thursday, when the doctor told me that, before I ever got to the surgery, before they ever took out most of my right lung, before we found out that it was the kind of, though cancer, it's, it's kind that's treated by surgery only. I didn't have to have any treatments, didn't have to have any chemotherapy, any radiation. I, I really was spared of the worst kinds of cancer treatments that many of you have experienced or know someone who has. But before all of that happened on that Thursday evening, when I first heard the word cancer and I didn't know what the prognosis was going to be, this is the thought that came to my mind and my heart. And I, and I think it is a glimpse or hint of wisdom, but it purely from God, not from me, because this isn't the kind of thing I would come up with. The thought that came to my mind and my heart was this. God is my sovereign. He is my king. I have given him my life and entrusted my soul to him. And he is so sovereign and so much the king of the universe who answers to nobody that whether he takes me to heaven at 37 or lets me live to be 97, he will be right either way way. And can I tell you something? I, I don't know how, I don't know why, I just know that. That brought me peace. It brought me joy to know that God was going to do the right thing according to God's standards no matter what that meant. Now I'm grateful he healed me but he didn't have to, to be right, because he is the king of the universe. There's something currently in my life also that's really a big struggle. It's very painful, and I'm going to take a minute just to share a little bit of it with you. And recently, I think there is something that's been a glimmer or glimpse or hint of wisdom that has come to my mind and heart in this matter. There's a person in my life who means very much to me who is suffering more right now as a human being than I think I've ever observed or watched someone suffer. This is Val's mom, my mother-in-law, Marilyn, who lost her husband of 61 years back in January to covid and Marilyn has tremendous dementia. She doesn't even, most of the time, know who Val is when Val goes to see her. She hasn't known me for a long time. But she is suffering in the loss of her life partner to the point where she spends every waking moment of her life in her nursing home screaming out as loud as she can. Val's experienced it, and Val says it sounds like someone who's trapped in a fire that level of panic and there's nothing we can do about it right now they're adjusting her medications we're praying like crazy we're trying to get professionals involved but Marilyn is suffering physically emotionally spiritually psychologically 
more than any other human I know of right now, and there's nothing I can do about it. There's nothing Val can do about it. Of course, we pray. And as I've been praying over Marilyn and praying for her, this thought began to come to my mind. And I think it might be, I don't know yet, but I think it might be a glimpse of this wisdom that can lead to peace and joy in our lives. I've been praying that God would pour out his mercy on Marilyn. And as I prayed for God's mercy, I stopped short to think this. I do not need to or even dare define for God or instruct him in what that mercy should look like. Because he is the God of mercy. He is the one that invented mercy. He is the king of the universe who has defined mercy. And so this, I think, godly or spiritual perspective that I could not come to on my own, but I've asked for, and I think God's beginning to give me a glimpse of it, looks like this, that as I ask for mercy, I rest in peace And looking forward to how God is going to pour out that mercy and not sure what it's going to look like, but know that it's going to be the kind of mercy that only the God of mercy can pour out on somebody's life. So I'm asking that God teach me not to let things throw me so much. That I see them as he sees them. This is only a test. Would you join me? Let's bow and pray. Evan in his message last week tells us what James tells us. That we should ask for wisdom. Right now I want to challenge you. To ask for wisdom. It is ours for the asking. Father, we need to see the tests and the trials and the temptations we encounter like you see them as opportunities to demonstrate that our faith is authentic and valid. I don't know about anybody else, Lord, but I'm not quite yet there. Things still throw me. Father, we ask for wisdom that we might see these things from your perspective with spiritual insight from a heavenly viewpoint. Lord, we seek your wisdom. We ask for it in the name of Christ. Lord, hear our prayers. Amen. Amen.